hey, you know what? In this, in this month, uh, we're gonna be focusing on better relationships. Now, it's not just about our relationships with other people. Sometimes we hit that. We'll hit the marriage and so forth and the family, and we'll hit some of that. Some of it, though, we're gonna talk even about what are your relationships like with your coworkers? What are your relationships like with partners maybe that you decide to go into a business? What is, y'all, do y'all hear what I'm saying? It's a, there's a myriad of things. There's a myriad of things that are relationship. But when we think about relationships, that's why we're doing what we're doing. The big game, party that we're gonna have here, my wife already alluded to that, that's, that's so that we can connect. We're gonna have some, if, depending on where we're located, we're gonna have some items set up like in the back so that the kids can play and the kids can even interact and we'll make sure we corral them and keep them, you know, like on the premises. Um, but then we're also going to have that ladies' breakfast. Now, it said nine o'clock up on the screen, but ladies, I'm asking the men to be here at nine so that we can have all the food ready for you. We're asking you to be here at 10. So if we can make sure that you get here at 10 o'clock because we want you to sleep in, we want you to be well rested when you come to enjoy the meal. And it's great, we've already had quite a few men have said, hey, I'll sign up, I'll help serve. Had one guy said, hey, I can't do anything but greet. And I said, well, I'm gonna put you in the foyer, you be a greeter. He said, I can't cook. I said, I can't either. I can do waffles, but it, you know, that'd take a long time. And listen, invite your friends. If you have a lady that you know that, that would love to come, and because this is for every lady. It's for singles, it's for married, it's for widowed. It does not matter because we wanna honor and celebrate our ladies. And we wanna honor and celebrate your friends if they wanna come. This is a great opportunity for us to reach out to them with the love of God, amen? All right, but today I'm gonna to begin this new series on what I feel like apart from God is our most important relationship and that is the relationship that we have with ourself. How about that? All right, I'm gonna read in context Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23 verse seven is gonna kind of be my focus scripture, but Proverbs chapter 23, and I'm gonna begin with verse number one, and I'm coming out of the Amplified. <clears throat> it says, when you sit down to dine with a ruler, there we go, perfect, with a ruler, consider carefully what is set before you. For you will put a knife to your throat if you are a man of great appetite. In other words, be careful with the delicacies, right? Don't desire his delicacies, for it is deceptive food offered to you with questionable motives. Y'all ever know sometimes people just want to wine and dine you, right? So when you're offered things that you're not accustomed to, realize that it can sway you in the wrong direction. That doesn't, even, that doesn't just have to do with a meal. That can have to do with anything. You know, I know there's a number of things that can entice people. Y'all ever heard of someone in public office getting enticed by a, uh, by a contract that somebody offered when they offered to help them out with large sums of money. Then verse number four says, do not weary yourself with the overwhelming desire to gain wealth. Some of y'all are like, huh? Is that what the Bible says? <clears throat> Cease from your own understanding of it. When you set your eyes on wealth, it is suddenly gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an evil eagle and flies to the heavens. So in other words, don't, here, here's what I hear this say. Don't allow wealth to be an idol. It can be a blessing and a tool, but it, it can also be fleeting here today and gone tomorrow. Are we correct on that? See, it as a gift from God that can be used for great good, but as an idol, it is a harsh master. If you're up underneath the weight of trying to make money, woo, I want more, 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 Lord. Sometimes more, more, more becomes Bernie Madoff. And why would you give your money to someone whose last name was Madoff? I don't know. <clears throat> Do not eat the bread of a selfish man or desire his delicacies. Here we go. Do not eat the bread of a selfish man or desire his delicacies. Verse seven, for as he what? 
thinks in his heart, so what? So is he. Now, we always read this verse, and usually we just read that verse. But if you'll see, this is something that is tied to even money in this case. It says, do not eat the bread of a selfish man. In other words, someone who's not a giver. So what we're saying is this is tied to their heart. So this is a heart condition. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. How many of y'all have some things in your heart that probably aren't the correct? You're probably not thinking correctly. Anybody here besides me? Come on. I can't stand it when y'all don't confess your sins. <laughs> y'all are all like, well, we don't, Pastor. Maybe you do. I'm asking the question to get a response, not, not a conviction. Well, I'm the only one. Good. I'll scratch the sermon because y'all all got it already. Okay. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. In behavior, so this is out of the Amplified, one who manipulates. As in his heart, so is he. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. So in other words, his behavior manipulates because that's what's in his heart. He says to you, eat and drink, yet it, yet his heart is not with you. You ever seen somebody who does that? Like, oh yeah, hey man, I just, yeah, man, let's get together. But their heart's not there, right? You, you know, you're, you're kind of like, well, we, I've, mm, come on somebody. Yet his heart is not with you, but it is begrudging the cost. Psalm, uh, Proverbs 23, seven, listen to it. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. Now in the context, because I always, I like to bring it in context. In the context is speaking of a selfish man. But today I want to address this in our lives. As we think in our hearts, so are we. One of the hardest things to do in our lives, at least from my life experience, is to accept ourselves for who we are. It is. I mean, how many of y'all have shortcomings? Answer, yes, thank you very much. How many of y'all have positives? Hallelujah, how many of y'all have strengths? How many of y'all married someone or you're in the family with someone who has different capabilities and talents than you do? Yes, every single one of us. And aren't we grateful for that? So I've done a lot of study on my own behavior. So I entitled this message, Me, Myself, and I. It's about multiple personalities. So today, that's what we're, no, I'm kidding. Me, myself, and I. Because what we really have to do is address us. I've got to address myself, where am I? How did I get here? And then how does God see me? Now understand this, I'm gonna promise you something because it's always convicting to me. You know, everybody said, pastor, don't be so hard on yourself. After last Sunday, I had a number of people who said that to me. Then I had a number of people who said, be harder on yourself. No, they didn't. But, but I, said, I said, no, no, no. I said, look, I've been evaluating myself since October of last year. This wasn't like something that just flew off the hand. I didn't just come in here and go, boom. No, no, I evaluated myself toward the end of the year. I, evalu I try to do that on a regular basis this time, and I wasn't so hard on myself introspectively. I was just like, God, we would love to see some change. I would love to get better. I would love to get better. So in other words, to get better, I need to know where I am, right? I need to understand where I am, who I am. So, so here... Is, is the hard thing for me. I've done a lot of study on my behavior over the years, my own behavior. I never will forget when I first got saved and Karen and I were first married. Uh, we got married not too long after I'd been walking with the Lord. And, uh, and I ended up with this, helping this lady in our church that grew up as, as in an alcoholic home. I did the same. And she just began kind of to talk to me and to say, hey, have you ever looked at this scripture? Have you ever heard this? Have you ever heard this? And honestly, it began, I went, oh man, that's why I act that way. Because I grew up in a lot of instability. I never knew what was gonna happen when I walked through the door. So I grew up almost afraid in some respects. Now I had a loving mom. My dad was loving when he wasn't drinking. He could be loving when he was drinking, but that could change in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. 
He was like the rapture. My dad had that down. But I've done a lot of study on that, and I find myself in my upbringing, my experiences, my feelings of self-worth, and how about this, self-depreciation. How many of y'all self-depreciate yourself? Man, I'm just not, just, oh, I'm just terrible. I mean, you wake up in the morning, you look in the mirror, and you go, I, Why? Why? Most men look in the mirror and go, yeah. <laughs> and their wife goes, why? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Self-worth, self-depreciation, it comes from areas in my own life. Most of you probably know this. You probably know this from school. Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run over this real quick but it's about how we feel about ourselves. He was talking about this. These are the basic five formative needs of humanity. Now understand this, and I'm telling you up front, Abraham Maslow, as far as I could find from my research, was an atheist, he was not a believer. But I wanna look at it from a humanist point of view first. Many of y'all are gonna think about this. This is in our formative years. These things are true. How about our physiological needs, our food, clothing, and shelter? Food, clothing, and shelter. How many of y'all know someone who grew up during the depression years? Okay, if you know someone who grew up during the depression years, you probably know something that their need for food and shelter and clothing, they have a lot of all of it because they didn't have a lot of it when they were in the depression. In other words, that, that those things right there, those physical things, they make sure that there is a, an amount of this. Do you understand? And they don't want to lose it. So the physiological, then go to the safety needs, security. How about your emotional security, your financial security, your health and your wellness? If you grew up and someone was perpetually sick in the home, you could have some issues with that. You know, you grow up, you become a hypochondriac. Every time you cough, you think I got cancer. You know, that's how it started with aunt so-and-so. You know, you have an insecurity because there was a lot of physical issues within your own family. How about emotional issues like with me? That there was not a, always a security there. So I would try to hibernate from that. That's one of the reasons I use my humor a lot of times as deflection. I always want to make, I was what they call the mascot of the family. I just tried to make everybody stay lighthearted because I didn't want things to go south. But the Lord's blessed me with that. I've had a blast with this humor. Got me in a lot of trouble in school though. Okay. Love and belonging needs. How about this? Friendships, acceptance, feeling love. Uh, like you belong, a closeness, a trust and acceptance. How about this? Receiving and giving affection. Man, Karen grew up in a loving, belonging family. They hugged each other all the time. We did not. First time, I'm like seeing them all hug each other, sit on the sofa close to one another. I'm like, what are y'all doing? That's why the Lord gave us Lydia because Lydia hugs us all the time. How many of y'all have had a Lydia hug? That's our middle daughter, a Lydia hug. Man, I'm telling you, that girl's gonna love you. Lord gave us Lydia because Karen tried to give me the hug for years. I'm like, hey, Karen would always tell me, don't pat the kids, they're not a dog. You know, because they come up and hug me and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm glad to see you. <laughs> That's your child, honey. Okay. <laughs> it was hard to give because I didn't understand it. Okay, how about this one? So esteem, the need for ad, uh, admiration and respect. Wow, how many men need respect? How many of y'all like it when your wife says, honey, you look nice? How many of y'all, come on, y'all know y'all need it? Yeah, we, we all do, that's right, that's right. But it comes across that love, that's what women, most women are looking for the love. Men just wanna hear the word, like, yeah, honey, man, you just look better than you did 10 years ago. Man, you tell your husband that. You just got yourself a Valentine's Day present. <laughs> Self-esteem, I'm okay with who I am. Personal worth, I matter and I have something to add. Hmm. Feelings of inferior inferiority can arise in those who lack self-esteem and others' respect. 
Esteems and social levels are vital needs for all of us. Being loved, feeling loved. Okay, so then he uses this term. Get ready, self-actualization. Look at yourself, you're actually here. All right, I just want you to know that. Self-actualization is at the very top of Maslow's hierarchy. It says, what a man can be, he must be. In other words, he's alluding to people's desire to reach their full human potential. Maslow's definition of self-actualization is as follows. He says, it may be informally defined as the complete use and exploration, exploit, exploitation of one's talents, abilities, and potentialities, among other things. So it's completely using everything that you have and everything that you are to achieve who you're self-actualized supposed to be. Such individuals, I think of, I think of like, um, what's his name? Jeff Bezos with Amazon. Such individuals appear to be content. Maybe Elon Musk. How many of y'all can think of somebody? Wow, man, that person's like reached such potential and they just keep striving, 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 striving. They tend to be content with themselves, achieving the best that they are capable of. They are persons who have reached or on their way to reaching their full potential. Self-actualizing people, they're self-aware. They're concerned with personal development. They're not concerned about other people's opinions and they're engaged in realizing their full potential. So we just went through all of these. These needs that Abraham Maslow came up with We know that we're all affected by those type things within our own lives, but now let's bring it down to a biblical point of view. Because if I take this from a humanistic point of view, then everything is reliant upon me and everything's reliant simply upon the environment in which I'm placed. Do y'all understand that? It's about where I am. It's about the context of everything around me. And then it's about me pushing for that potential within myself. Does that sound like, it sounds like humanism, doesn't it? Come on, we can do this. We can make it. It sounds like individualism in a lot of respects. Because even then in my relationships, looking for love and belonging, what do I begin to do? I begin to manipulate people so I can get what I want. Then I can even do this. I can even become codependent on people. That if they get moved, then all of a sudden, one of the bricks in my house has been taken away and things become unstable. So let's address this from a biblical perspective. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a woman thinks in her heart, so is she. His hierarchy of needs is not perfect. Because when we think about this, we have needs that must be met, but before, listen, before we can be fully who we're called to be, we really have to know the Lord. We do. We have to know the Lord. All that brain and all that power and all of those things that we see in humanity and sometimes we even champion and we set those people up on pedestals. Listen, if we all understand it, without Christ, it's empty. So the first thing I want us to look at is provision. What about our needs being met? How about this, Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply every, every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. How about Philippians 4.11 and 12, it says, now, not that I am speaking of being in need, Paul said, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content, he was writing this from jail, He says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. In other words, my God shall supply all my needs. 2 Corinthians 9 verse eight, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, how many more times could you put all in this? You may abound in every good work. God is able to make what? All grace abound to you. There's no lack in his provision for your needs. There's no lack in the provision of his grace. Oh man, I just sinned so bad. God could never forgive me. That's bull. 
That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. That's what kept me at home sometimes instead of going to church. God, I failed you. I don't want to go in and everybody to find out what I've done. Everybody doesn't know what you did. They're trying to keep hidden what they did. Somebody, but for the grace of God, there stand I. That's why when somebody comes up and they say, man, pastor, I have something. Oh, I've got, just got some issues. I had a guy meet with me one time. He's like, man, I know you're gonna be really disappointed in me. And he shared with me and he goes, well, how do you feel about me? I said, man, I love you. That is awesome that you just came and shared that with me because now the Lord, it's been revealed. It's out in the open. God's gonna take care of it. He's forgiven you. You will walk in victory in this area of your life in Jesus' name, amen? He goes, man, I had no idea this is how it was gonna be. I've been walking, that's like walking around with a broke hip. And they're like, hey, hip replacement will fix that. You walk around with it for 25 years. Then all of a sudden you go, you know what? I think I'm gonna have a hip replacement. You get a hip replacement, you walk out, you're like jumping and leaping and praising God. You go, why didn't I do that 25 years ago? Listen, why does the scripture say, confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed? Because there's healing in confessing your sins one to another. It's getting it out into the open so that the Lord can deal with it. Somebody. And so many times what we do is, because listen, we're young, we think, oh, I'm gonna hide it, I'm gonna cloak it. God already sees it. You're already laid bare before the Lord. He sees you in the shower. I, I know, I thought I was gonna get a response. Y'all were trying to go, what does that mean? That's what I used to tell my youth all the time. I used to say, listen, you think you're hiding things from God? God sees you in the shower. All things are laid naked before the Lord. Psalm 37, verse 25, 26, I have been young and I am old, yet I have not seen, come on, the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. You know what? Put that up on your refrigerator. You're like, oh man, I just don't know about the Lord's provision. Put Psalm 37, verse 25, 26, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread, for he is lending generously and his children become a blessing. Hallelujah. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. Psalm 37, verse 18 through 19, the Lord knows the days of the blameless and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine, they have abundance. Did y'all hear that? In the days of famine, they have abundance. People keep talking about a food shortage. I'm like, Lord, I'm gonna trust you. You tell me to go buy food, I'll go buy food. But I'm trusting you that you're gonna take care of me no matter what comes our way. Can I get an amen on that? Come on. Listen, we gotta trust God. We gotta trust the Lord. While everybody else is shaking, while all things can be shaken, the one thing that should not be shaken is the children of God or the people of his, of his flock, of his family. We do have need of the Lord. So we do have need. The Lord is our provider. The Lord knows our needs. He wants to meet them. Do you have need of clothes? I want to encourage you on something. Do y'all have need of clothes? Anybody here? Y'all like need some new stuff. Come on, somebody. I got to tell you something. One time my wife needed some new stuff. I'm not telling you to go to Goodwill. My wife's like, don't do that. No, no, no. I'm serious. She, she was in need of some new stuff. She went in and cleaned her closet out and gave away a bunch of things that she had. Someone came later, I can't even remember when it was, and brought her clothes, some that still had the tags on them, and said, hey, I don't have need of these anymore. Would you like somebody? Somebody, I give and it's given back. I sow and I reap. Now I'm telling you, listen, there's been a few times when I've walked into my closet and I'm like, I need to get rid of some of this stuff. But I don't just think of getting rid of it. I think, you know what? I'm gonna sow this. I'm telling you, I'm gonna give this so that I can receive. Amen? I know that if I give this, Lord, I'm gonna clear out for your space what you will bring in. Do you have need of clothes? Do you have need of shelter? Do you believe that the Lord can provide you a house? Amen. The Lord provided us a place. 
You believe the Lord can provide you somewhere to live? He can. Listen, he's your provider, not me. He's your provider. He's the one who can give you shelter. He's the one who can give you food. I told y'all this a long time ago. I was a youth pastor. I took a huge pay cut to be a youth pastor. (laughs) I know that's hard to believe. I took a pay cut to be a youth pastor. I was driving, so we're using gas and all this stuff. You know, we didn't use our credit card a whole lot. So one day I go and I'm like, Lord, I have no lunch. I went to visit a homeschool family at like 1030 in the morning. They said, wow, we've been up really early. Would you like to eat lunch with us? I'm like, Lord, thank you. Give me this day my daily bread. Man, I was so hungry. Somebody. And the Lord provided that food for me. Ask your heavenly father. Ask God who is in heaven for provision he will provide. He will provide. I'm not sure he will. I know he will. I know he will. I'm gonna be honest with you. Sometimes we bail each other out too quick. Sometimes you're looking for something else. Sometimes you're looking for the provision from another hand before you're looking for the hand of God. We better have discernment even when we're helping people. We better know. Is the Lord telling us to do that? Praise God. If he is, then do it. But I'm gonna tell you something. You better rely on him. 100%. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Amen? He's a God who heals. He's a God who provides. Are y'all getting this? What about our need for security? We may, may have grown up without security. That's a point of contention for us. Well, I wanna bring you a few scriptures that assure us of security with God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. How about this one, Psalm 70, verse five. But as for me, I am poor and needy. Please hurry to my aid, O God. You are my helper and my savior. O Lord, do not delay. How about Job eleven eighteen? 18? And you will feel secure because there is hope. You will look around and take your rest in what? Come on. <clears throat> Psalm 16, verse eight. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Psalm 40, verse two. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Hallelujah. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in time of trouble. Psalm 46, one, Psalm 9, 10. And those who know your name put their trust in you for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Philippians 1, 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm trusting God. You're like, well, my kids accepted the Lord. Now they've walked away from God. I know it was a real experience. Then put that promise on your fridge. God, I'm trusting you're gonna bring it to pass. I can whip them. I can can restrict them. I can put all kinds of things around them, but you are their God. Let them come to that reality. Look, stand on the word. Amen? How many of y'all have tried to straighten stuff out and you have just gotten it more in a mess? You tried to straighten it out and all you did was twist it up. You tried to fix it. Anybody here ever tried to fix it? Boy, I tried to fix it one time. I tried to fix it. I, Karen and I, were. I was in a place to where I was doing some work at this place and and, and I was like, you know what? I need another job. So I, I began to go look for another. I bet you I applied at five or six places. Nobody would hire me. Nobody would hire me. I'm like, I am good. <laughs> like, what are y'all talking about? Y'all don't hire me? I applied as a warehouse person just to move furniture around. They wouldn't hire me. I'm like, I'd be the best warehouse person you've ever seen in your life. They wouldn't hire me. Finally, I was walking out to the car. I felt dejected. I'm like, Lord, they're not hiring me. He said, did I tell you to go look for a job? (laughs) My old boss called me about that time. He said, hey, newbie, I need you to come help me over at my house. I'm laying some side. Will you come help me lay some side? I said, sure. I'm out there laying side with him. We, We were still good friends. And he goes, hey, you want a job as a salesman? I'm looking for a salesman. I think you'd be great. You've already worked in the shop. You know the product. He said, man, you could do a great job. You could help me troubleshoot things out. I'm out there laying side thinking, I broke my back. Chasing down five job leads. 
And all I had to do was come out here with my old boss, come on, and lay some sod, and I got a job with more money than I made when I left there. Can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Our need for security. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his holy, of his glory with great joy, Jude 124. How about this one? Hebrews 13, five, for he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Listen, you and I are secure in Christ. That's where our security is. That's where our security is. I'm gonna tell you something. Up until, man, I, I mean, I was, I was still an adult. Man, I, I was so scared of the dark. There would be a creek in the house. And I, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you just saw somebody, <laughs> you know? I mean, some of that was from some of the movies that I watched and so forth. You know, I'm like, pull the shower curtain back. Hey, there was one morning I was getting ready to go to work. I wouldn't even pull the shower curtain back. I'm like, I know the exorcist girl's back there. I know she's gonna be like, bah! Karen's like, you didn't take a shower this No, no, I, I, just, I, just, I just went ahead and went to work. <laughs> I didn't say, oh, I was scared to death because she had told me when she went to bed, if you're watching that, it's gonna, it's gonna trouble you. <laughs> I was like, this ain't gonna bother me a bit. I mean, even getting up off the sofa, walking to the bedroom, and we were in a two bedroom duplex, was hard for me. I'm like, I know, gonna come out in a minute. Y'all know what I'm saying? And then, you know, then I'm like, what in the world am I afraid of? God is my shield and buckler. God's my high tower, amen? God has me surrounded. I walk in light, not in darkness. Even if I'm in the dark, God's still the light, amen? At the name of Jesus, the demons must flee. I have security in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why am I walking in fear? Fear should not have a hold on us because perfect love casts out all fear. You're turning on the news. Some of y'all are turning the news on and then you're like, oh my gosh, we're gonna die. Yes, eventually we all will, right? Unless we go up in the rapture. But the fact of the matter is this, you don't need to fear. What is the enemy of this? What is, what is the God of this world's desire to do? To have us walk in fear and not in faith. To have us walk petrified so that we don't mobilize. So what about this, belonging, love and affection? How in the world does that work in? How about this? Come on, Romans 12, huh? So that we may, that though many are one body in Christ, individually, listen, members of one another. Come on, we're one. We're together. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter your nationality. It doesn't matter your language. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter the eco, uh, the eco economic status of your family, it does not matter. There's no hierarchy, lowarchy. We're all one. You just look at somebody. You know what I told people? I said, look, you want to see what our origin is? Cut somebody because all of us bleed red. All of us bleed red, ladies and gentlemen. I bleed red. Y'all bleed red. Anybody in here bleed green? Out. <laughs> I got a movie for y'all to be in if you bleed green. Here we go. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Man, I gotta accept people, amen? How about this, 1 Corinthians 12.13, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we are all made to drink one spirit, John 1.12-13. But to all who did not receive him, who believed in his name, who did receive him, believed in his name, he gave the right to become what? Children of God. We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but we were born of God. How many of y'all are believers in here? Then God is your heavenly father. Christ is our elder brother, who is our high priest seated at the right hand of the father. And every single one of us are brothers and sisters in Christ. I gotta tell you something, you haven't been on the mission field, you need to go. One, one Sunday or one uh, week year when I was at my last church, we went to the Philippines. And I was gonna preach in one of the churches in the Philippines. And I thought, man, I wonder how it's gonna feel to preach in the Philippines. You know, everybody's asleep on the other side of the globe. We're all gonna be awake over here. I wonder what it's gonna feel like. You know what? It felt like the family of God. I felt as comfortable there as I felt anywhere else. 
Come on. That's the family of God. Yesterday, let me tell y'all something. Belonging and loving one another is part of who we are as believers. Amen? They will know that you are Christians, listen to me, by your love one for another. When they see that love, when they walked onto this property, even yesterday, Kim Owens, who is the outreach pastor at World Harvest, they, they loaned us their moonwalk. We, I said, Kim, go up there and do a giveaway. Kim got up there. Hey, come on, everybody give me, you know, it was beautiful because we're the body of Christ. I looked over at the preschool table when we were out there doing the outreach and who was it? It was one of the ladies that I know. She and her husband are from Russia. One of the ladies that I know from World Harvest was running our preschool table for the crafts. I said, hey, she goes, hey, Pastor Tim, I just wanted to tell you, I just so appreciate y'all doing this. This is so much fun. My kids are having a blast. I said, what are you doing working? She goes, this is what I do. And I am fine, I want to serve. Isn't that great? And then I'll become interconnected with that person. She said, hey, we'll be back for the next one. Isn't that awesome? The body of Christ. Had another lady come up and tell me, she said, hey, we had her. She was the one with the grandkids. Hey, we had her grandkids. Had them for a day and a half and we saw that this was happening. Thank y'all so much for doing this. This has been a lot of fun for our kids, our grandkids. She said, I just want to tell y'all something. I know you're probably wondering, was this worth it? She said, you know what? I've lived down the street for 12 years. We attend some churches off and on. But what you did was just open the door for me to want to come attend yours. I said, well, praise the Lord. I said, that's awesome. We may have a brother or sister in Christ living right down the road. We didn't even know it. How about this? How about two or three different conversations with other people? who are either searching or seeking for the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me, if we don't put ourselves out there, we don't get anything. Amen? Man, I appreciate Angel just saying, hey, pastor, I want to do this. Hey, pastor, I want to do this. Hey, pastor, I want to do this. And praise the Lord, it was so much fun. I want the snow. We're the body of Christ. We're members of God's household. We're to live like it and we're to love like it. I have things I can share with you and things that you can share with me, I can learn from you and you can learn from me. How many of y'all listen to other preachers on TV or podcast or something? How many of y'all do that? Come on. Oh, y'all, some of y'all are like, I don't want y'all to think, Pastor, Pastor, I don't want you to think I'm listening to somebody else. <laughs> I know you're lying. Even though you, no, but seriously, you know what though? But I loved it. Here's what, here's what you find out real quick especially as a pastor. If I listen to other pastors that I like or admire and I think, you know what, man? You know, they have a, a good ministry. You know that's good soil and I listen to them. And some people will say, well, do you get anything out of their messages? And I'm like, yeah, five things I said last week. <laughs> no, seriously, because iron sharpens iron. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of that because I learn from them. I walk in some of their maturity. See, they're mature in some areas where I'm not mature. They know some things that I don't know. But if I listen to them, I can glean from that. Amen? Amen? So, you know, like when Kim Owens came yesterday, she goes, yeah, you know, I just wanted to come back. I said, hey, hey, we're all good. We need to cross-pollinate. Amen. Amen? We do. We need a little bit of, come on, man, can you only imagine what the body of Christ would be like? If we were all united, woo, it'd be a flood of revival in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. If we would just link arms with the Lord Jesus Christ and say, hey, God, we're here. We're here to love on people, no matter what denomination they're from. Come on, somebody. No matter what background they're from, no matter what nationality, no matter, Lord, we're here for one another. Belonging is not just found in being loved. Listen to me. Belonging is found in loving other people. Having our needs met is one thing, but true joy is in sharing what we have with other people. <laughs> Ephesians 4.28 says, let him who stole steal no longer, but let him labor, working with his hands, the thing that is good that he may have something to give in return to him who has need. Martin Luther King Jr. said this. He said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing? For others. Ronald Reagan 
said, we can't help everyone, but everyone can help someone. Share what you have. Romans 12, 13 says, share what you have with God's people who are in need. Be hospitable. Last two things, and I gotta go quick, so I'm gonna ask the worship team to come because that'll make me act like I'm going quick. <clears throat> First one is esteem, respected by others, a self-respect. Are you getting a hold of who you are? Listen to me, you're everything that I just told you you are because everything I just told you are is who God said we are to be. Amen? What about respect? It says Romans 12, three, by, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought, but to think with sober judgment. How many of y'all have all the gifts? How many of y'all have all the abilities? I'm so glad y'all are responding now. How many of y'all have all the abilities? How many of y'all can do any job out there? You don't need any help. You know what that's called? Independence. We're not called to be independent. We're called to be dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ and his body, the church, and us together by what every joint supplies, we accomplish the task. Not alone. The enemy works in isolation. The enemy works to isolate. God works to bring together. And when we're not together, man, the enemy's always working on disunity in the church. He's working on disunity in every ministry of the church. Come on. He's working dis on disunity among every church in every city. He's working on, on disunity within the body of Christ because that's where he operates the best is disunity. God's working for unity. God's saying unify. Now listen to me. He's saying unify, but unify under me. See, our issue is this. So what ends up happening is we are all working on this unity. Well, I can't get in unity unless I agree. Y'all understand me because there's false doctrine all in the church now. I hope y'all know that. There's some that have gone left. Some have gone far right. Listen to me. God says, hey, how about just look up here and I'll take you up higher. I'll take you up higher. But if we don't abide up underneath his word, ladies and gentlemen, then we can't unify. I remember going to a meeting one time and they said, hey, we're gonna bring in all these different other faiths. And I said, whoa, 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 aren't we a Christian organization? Aren't we to be united in Christ? Well, yeah, but you know, everybody. I said, whoa, 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 no, not everybody. Now, I was associate pastor at the time. I went to my pastor and I said, hey, pastor, this is the direction they're going. We're out. We'll start our own. Come on. Because it says, come out from among them and be separate. Listen, there are times where we have to stand our ground, church. You know, everybody's saying, oh, unity, 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 don't judge, don't judge. No, some things are black and white. Yes. Some things are just clear. God said it, we agree on it, that's what we do. And people say, well, people are gonna leave your church because you got that stance. So what? So be it. Do y'all hear me? And I'm not, I'm not being pious. I'm just saying, are we gonna live by the word? Right. Or are we gonna live by what man says? Are we gonna abide in the word? He says, if you abide in me and my word ab abides in you, come on. Amen. <clears throat> See, our esteem should be found in who God called us to be, no more, no less. We need to sharpen the tools, the skills that he has given us. That doesn't mean we can be lazy, but we need to also know that we are all worthy. Even if I have little gifts, I had a lady yesterday, and man, all she did was pick up a broom and a dustpan at the end of the day, and I was like, thank you. The Lord just used you. I'm not more esteemed to you in the eyes of God, for, for with God there are no favorites. Do y'all hear that? He looks at us all. Now, finally, we come to that self-actualization. This is a, a tricky one, because a lot of times our goals are to be better than others, and to compare ourselves with others' achievements, not to be all God's called us to be. Our goal is not to achieve individuality, but to fulfill the will of the Lord in Christ Jesus. Our self-actualization is actually fulfilled to fulfill the will of the Lord for our lives. It's to do the two things I told you last week. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. 
That's my self-actualization. My self-actualization is actually realized in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. My self-actualization is to be who God has called me to be. Listen, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you may abstain from sexual immorality, and it goes on. How about this one? Romans 12, 2, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind, and by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will. How about Mark 3, 35, for whoever does the will of God, Jesus said, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. And you say, well, Pastor Tim, I don't even know what the will of God is. I'm gonna tell you something. Pray, ask the Lord, and read the word. Tell him, God, what do you want for my life? What do you want for my life? Some, some, Some of you are still searching for, hey, God, what is your will for my life? Even in our midlife, some some of us are still like, God, what's, you know, right now I'm like, Lord, what's the will for the remainder of my life? You know, for this last season of my life, and I know I'm not, not like dead, but I'm like, what's the season for the next 20 years, 15 years, should I, should I be able to live that long, amen? Now, I desire to live to 100 if I can still, you know, <laughs> mobilize. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying. I wanna be like, how are you, 100? <laughs> Whoever does the will of God, Lord, I want to know what your will is. How many of y'all say that, right? God, I just want to know. Man, I want to know that I'm clearly in the center of your will. Then love him with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. I'm going to close with this. Philippians 3.12, stand with me. What did Paul say? Wow. Here, here this man is in jail. He is about to give his life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's writing this letter from a Philippian jail. I'm like talking, I'm not talking like a cush jail. I'm talking like a hole in the ground. They said that he was in a cell where they would lower his food down to him. That was the only light that he had. When it rained, it rained in the cell. Hmm. He said, hey, not that I have already obtained this or am already made perfect, but I press I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Y'all, Christ died for us. You know what he says to us? Take up your cross and die for me. He said, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, I forget what lies behind. Now listen, those needs in Maslow's hierarchy, those are real needs, but I gotta tell you something. And I came to a place in the Lord and I had to do some, re, I had to do some dealing with my past, but I came to the place in the Lord to where I felt like the Lord said, quit living back there, Tim. I'm your father. You're in my house. Don't live back here. That, you have now become a new creation in me. I forget what lies behind. I strain forward to what lies ahead. Listen, I press on toward the goal, and I love this, for the prize of the what? Upward call of God. One thing that we miss, church, and our churches today, is here's what we've done. We've become very this way. Old architecture always drew your eyes heavenward. Every steeple was there to draw your eyes toward heaven. It wasn't just to put the cross higher. Come on. It was to draw your eyes heavenward. Every hallway was to draw your eyes. Every church was to draw your eyes heavenward. I'm gonna tell you something. I know that ceiling's black, but look to heaven because that's where God is. 
seated in the heavens, looking down upon us. And the power of his presence is here because he said, wherever two or more are gathered, there I am in your midst. So it's this way and it's this way. It's this way and it's this way. But I press toward heaven. That's my final destination. That's why I told you last week, I don't wanna get there and go, man, I regret that I didn't press. I, I regret, Lord, I regret that I didn't press on toward the goal for the prize. You said something before me. It wasn't self-actualization. No, God, I want to be everything you've called me to be. I want to use my gifts, my abilities that you have blessed me with because he's blessed us all with gifts and talents. You got them. Our kids got them. Our young people have them. Man, don't you love it when you see kids worshiping the Lord? And you're, you're sitting there going, man, look at them going after God. Because here's what you realize. Man, they got a long time to run. <laughs> and I'm only in the quarter mile. But they're in the marathon. Hmm. So let this mind. This is the will of God that you love him with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength that we love our neighbors as ourselves, and that we go into this world and we make disciples and that we understand who we are in him. Now, I wanna, I wanna say something because I wanna close with this. Me, myself, and I, are you okay with who you are in Christ? And if you're not, you just, here's what I want you to do. I want you to move. I like what Kathy said last week in her testimony. She said, hey, sometimes you need to move. If you're not okay, and listen to me, every single one of us has something most of the time that we're dealing with, trying to get over ourself, right? But you say, man, I, you know what? I wanna, I wanna press further, Lord. I wanna be better, even in my understanding of who you've made me to be. Some of y'all self-depreciate yourself all the time. You say, I can't, I'm not able. I mean, I, I'm not telling you to, you know, like say some, some things you don't. Don't do heart surgery, you know. No, no, I can't do heart surgery. Good, don't do it. But you're saying this about yourself it just on a regular basis. I'm a failure. I'll never amount to anything. Man, I don't know what my kids, you know, they'd be better off without me. Some of y'all have had suicidal thoughts. My spouse would be better off with somebody else. Come on, y'all know you have. Don't you lie to me. God works best in the light. That's where, because he is light. So uncloak all that junk. Bring it before him and say, Lord, I'm gonna accept who you've made me to be. Now listen, if, you're, if you don't know today, if you, hey, Pastor Tim, if I was to die today, I don't know if I'd go to heaven. Then this altar's open for you because here's what you need to do. You need to admit you're a sinner. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to confess him as Lord, Amen and then follow him. Dedicate to follow him for the rest of your life. If you're online and you're listening, same thing. You just need to say, God, I'm just asking you now, forgive me of my sins and I wanna follow you. I believe Jesus died for my sins and I'm trusting him with myself, with my family, with my life. And it's in Christ's name I pray, amen. This altar is open. If you wanna just come and just put yourself before God and say, God, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna remind myself of who you have made me. Come on, lay some of the baggage at the cross. Amen? Let's go before the Lord.